everyone relax. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that we are meeting here today on Wurundjeri land and like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, it's a great um, pleasure and honour to be here with you today and, and thank you all so much for braving it out in the cold, but to um, discuss with um, Amrita Hepi, who we've been really fortunate to be working with over the last couple of years. And I guess I'll begin by, um, by also um, suggesting that this particular show was one of our first um, victims of the pandemic. So it was originally slated for um, April of last year and um, we made a decision quite early on that we would um, forecast kind of quite far into the future. So it's, it's great to be able to begin um, 2021 showing Monumental. And um, in, in many ways, and this is probably something that will start to get teased out in the conversation, um, you know, the work has become, has, has, has gained a, a, a more heightened degree of, um, of um, potency at this particular time, temporal potency and political, social, cultural potency. Mm. Um, but um, before we get into, so we're going to run this quite quite informally. So if anyone has any questions at any stage, please just um, raise raise a hand. Mm. Um, but it's it's going to be very informal. But um, I thought before we start discussing this particular work that we are um, sitting in. So as as many of you would have seen the work before, there's uh, of course a, um, like an extraordinary soundtrack. But for the sake of this conversation, we've um, had to turn that off. But once we finish up, we'll um, resume the sound component within the work. Um, so Amrita, so you're, you recently moved down to Melbourne in the last um, year or so, born in, in Townsville and then mostly working in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So um, I just thought, I, I, I thought we'd begin by um, talking about your, um, you know, your, I guess your background in, as a dancer and then um, evolving into both uh, the role of dancer and, and a choreographer, but I guess I'm more interested in in this particular context into your, um, I guess, quite sustained pushing into the realm of, of contemporary art and visual arts, mm. which is, is something that is um, is probably doesn't happen enough in in contemporary dance and the visual arts. And, you know, we can discuss that a bit further about its. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of now as the idea of the kind of um, incorporation of contemporary dance within a, a museum or gallery program. Mm. But do you want to just talk about your, um, I guess your relationship to contemporary art and how you've, um, I guess, sort of worked between the contemporary art realm and also within the visual art realm as well? Mm, mm, mm. <coughs> well, I'll begin by saying that <coughs> The distinctions are quite arbitrary and for those that have really been involved in uh, contemporary art they would have seen notions of performance and I know you have for a long time um, and dance being in, in, inside all of those realms. I trained as a dancer and, and that was um, yeah, my, my background and my coming to my practice and I think that although there may be a kind of feeling of maybe a renaissance of contemporary dance entering into contemporary art. For me, um, it's always been something that either should be there or has been there mm. with practitioners that we've seen for a long time. Um, yes, as I said, as I said, I was born in Townsville and then mostly spent a lot of my time in Sydney and was lucky to have trained from a young age in dance and I think that gave me a very physical language. It gave me an understanding of um, for me, witnessing others, but also being witnessed in a certain way. And I guess from a young age, working with the idea of the gaze and how that is, especially in performance, or held to attention, how to hold attention with the body, mm. how to hold focus, and for my own self, how to hold focus on something as well. And I think that um, in regards to, yeah, in regards <coughs> to that dance training, it's it's been fundamental in my framing of, of or creating a context because the work that I make will always begin with my own body. Mm. Um, 
so yeah I think mm, yeah it's hard to and maybe also my opinion of that has changed definitely in the last five years I used to think that those silos were something that really existed and that there was a way of being a dancer in the world and then being a contemporary artist and that they were totally separate. But I think as an artist, as a dancer, you kind of are just propelled to make the things that you want to make and to be able to hold the attention and the focus on doing those things. I'm really aware in artist talks, I try, I'm always trying to not be aphoristic in what I'm talking about, to try and hold a certain specificity. Mm. Um, but yeah, dancing taught me how to have a focus and an attention on things. And, and that, I think, was an incredibly useful skill to um, cultivate and that was cultivated by other teachers and people that were influential to me. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's, that's actually a, a really interesting, um, I, I won't say distinction, but it is a, an interesting point that the idea of you know, the performative and, and you know, whether that be in dance or whether that be some sort of other performative practice mm. within a visual arts setting in which that kind of idea of the um, holding the audience is so embodied within the body mm. itself. So when you, um, like, a, a, as, in, a, as in, this is a, a case in point, um, you know, you so used to being um, the kind of mobiliser of the work in a very live sense, mm. of being so present and, and, and um, kind of embodying and evolving the work as you're going. So for you, like doing a project like this, which um, which sort of takes that kind of um, that nowness out in mm. some ways, that takes you to a degree that kind of that moment of the performing live out the of encounter, the, yeah, yeah. That encounter. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that relationship to um, a work that you create that you're not? There all the time. Present in, you know, <laughs> om omnipresently. Yes. I mean, you are yes. within it omnipresently, <laughs> but um, that sort of distinction between the kind of the live and the, um, the, the kind of, I guess, the proxy in some ways. Mm -hmm. Even in the theatre or in any kind of dance or performance, there is always the, reg like the residue of the performance. And I think that this term gets talked about a lot that there is always an after, like there's always something that exists after, whether that is the presence of this video or whether that is something that you're holding on to in a theatre. Like the notion that performance or the encounter of the performance is only a temporary one or ephemeral, I think is it's incredibly romantic, but it's, I just can't believe it. I just do not think that, you know, you, 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 sometimes you remember things, sometimes they stay with you and whether there is an object present or whether there is a video present or whether it is documented, whatever it is, but there is, it, it, it continues to exist and to be manipulated, whether it's in the live or whether it's the live that's being documented, that it, the presence of that stays with you. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with, and I, yeah, I just, Obviously, there is a very much a difference between this video and then the performance that I made, but the encounter with the live is always there to be had mm. if you are ready and willing and wanting to have it with that work, mm. no matter what the medium is. And then I think sometimes it can be even more present when there is somebody in the room. Mm. And that affects you. I can still remember the effect of... Um, yeah, of, of performance. And, and that's not to say I remember them because they're good or I remember them because they're bad, but they, they stay with me. And maybe that is the reason that it continues to stay with me in this um, pushing of the, like, the live encounter, the continuation of practice and trying to just, yeah, continue to do because it just isn't, it's just, yeah, I just don't agree or take that position that, um, yeah, the live continues to exist once it is over. Mm. I mean, I think this was has been, in some ways, exacerbated within not just dance but theatre as well. Where you know, for many years, the idea of um, taking photos or or documenting a performance that you were at was um, 
you know, quite explicitly... Um, not allowed. Not allowed. Yes. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, I think has been, you know, within particular um, dancers or choreographer, choreographers' works have, have been, you know, those kind of um, um, you know, mores have been, have been challenged to a degree, you know, purposefully. Of course. But I, I guess that, that has also, you know, through a situation at, uh, as the pandemic, you know, I guess that also creates this kind of um, a, a different, what, well, it will, it will um, animate change, certainly in this idea of the, um, the kind of how something is recorded or, or presented or, or disseminated to audiences. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, your feelings about how that exists within that kind of the idea of the, I mean this is very different in, in that it, it is a, a staged and constructed work mm. rather than a, a documented work. Mm, mm, mm. So to address like the, <coughs> I feel in some ways that this idea of taking um, a photo of a live performance in order to remember it, it's almost to prove the, the presence of the viewer in being there, to say like, I, I saw that performance, I was there, I, I and it, there's a certain feeling of ownership that, that you know, it's to, to own it by, to, which is to take a photograph. And a part of me is, I, I understand the compulsion to do that, to want to remember and to hold on to these things. And we do this in all different ways. And I think in the pandemic, I had a real um, recalcitrance to a lot of things were moving online. And I was like, I just don't want to flatten the experience of the live, you know, that experience of the live. And I did not want to give in to the immediate market-driven demand of putting everything out there straight away. I was like, can we have a moment of patience? To just, you know, wait a second before we continue. And I understand that, like, the show must go on, that things need to happen, that there is, you know, a curiosity and a desire to see art in different ways. But I really did have, like, a, a, a moment of going, I will not do an online dance performance. I will not. I'm sorry, but I cannot attend... And it, I cannot attend another online dance class and I am happy that they exist because I think that they are a format that is important and necessary but I was like, I'm willing to wait, I'm willing to be patient and I'm willing to work on things in my own time. Mm. And so, and that's another thing in regards to, I guess, performance changing the rules and the codes, the social function of a theatre and of a gallery space. And it's, it's really interesting. It's something that I'm really now thinking more and more about in my performance and in my performances. Who owns the image if, and who owns the, the feeling or how do you, yeah, how do you, and, and what's with the notion of possession, especially in contemporary art? I, I mean, I get it because it's like wanting to hold on to a moment in time to kind of, Especially, yeah, it, with with objects, I understand it. But in performance, it's it's obviously a, a slippery medium. So I think, yeah, I'm, and a, a part of me with this work is actually glad that there was the moment of waiting. You know, we made this work in January 2020, and this was uh, it was it was definitely reactive. It was after the endeavor. Uh, the building of the Endeavour, which was a ship, was to be launched to commemorate Captain Cook. And there was a few buildings that were going up. And, you know, Cook uh, represents a lot. He was an intrepid explorer. He holds a lot of ideals around enlightenment. He was incredibly curious. He was out to go and, you know, see what was around there. He represents so many um, things around, yeah, that, that period of enlightenment. But the thing that I think struck strikes me about that beyond obviously there is then a, a sordid history because it marks the beginning of something is the kind of that enlightenment can only happen in one way you know that it can't and this is I mean to tie it back to kind of um, feelings in the pandemic that there wasn't any room to wait like we can't wait anymore and I understand that the restlessness I 
do and the desire to be curious, to be out in the world, to be putting it to the feelings of connection. But I wonder, I guess, um, there, there has to be, there is obviously so many ways that um, enlightenment <laughs> happens and sometimes patience waiting can be one and you know there's just a multitude of, of ways that these things can happen and in relation to this work it became apparent after <laughs> making it and and being in the performance that pathos wasn't the only way of, of doing things and to to I guess in one way to go in search of what once was is can be um, an incredibly tiring or exercise so to monumentalize something, of course there is going to be change. And even once the kind of symbolic thing of the monument is torn down, there is the, the then monumental becomes that act. And then there is another, and then there is another. And so, yeah, I think I'm glad that there was a moment of waiting because it made me approach how I wanted to um, show this work, it made me rethink, I guess, um, the pathos that's inherent in questioning monuments and what happens once we tear down the, you know, what is symbolically uh, bad, you know, which is, I'm sorry, but that is an, act, it, it's a fantasy that that then becomes, it's ripping that down and that act is again, a, yeah, a fantasy, it is, and that things would change from that are a fantasy, but the act is still potent. Mm. When it's, you know, I was thinking as I was coming here about the, um, you know, in some ways the, the kind of the similarities between dance and and um, and public sculpture of these kind of monuments, you know, of mm. the, the um, you know, this this notion of, of European discovery is kind of embodied in the kind of the, you know that. The depiction of, of somebody who um, is in part responsible for it. Mm. So do you want to? Do you ever think about this idea about um, you know, and in, in broadly in relation to this project, specific mm -hmm. project about the idea of um, about the monument of the figure, and I guess the um, the symbolism of 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 dancers um, more actively engaging with that figure as a as a static historical point. Mm. But in a kind of a sense of the now, in terms of the dance. Mm -mm. Do you mean that that it is that the dancers keep on moving and will continue to move, and that, that it's an act uh, that dance is kind of given in a transmission that has to keep on changing, and that's like, and the monument of the dance is within its specific like specificity of its transmission, mm. whereas the monument of the sculpture which is incredibly bodily you know it's not to take away from objects whatsoever because they they like there is ideas around mnemonics for example within um, different traditions that um, take the form of uh, keeping the physical and carving it into um, an object that then becomes incredibly bodily and it stays as it is I mean maybe it decomposes after time mm. but um, yeah, I guess moving around a static figure. I mean, in this, in this video, none of these static figures are static. They are all in. They've all been interrupted by the touch of the other. Mm. You know, and and this is whether they are static monuments that have been defaced. They are whether they are dancers that are moving and monumentalizing a certain moment in time, and kind of adding to the soft power monument of you know, continuation, we see Busby Berkeley in this kind of soda fountain post-war, reminding us of the monumentalism of, of history and nationalism. Um, and I think, you know, that like dance choreography has always been a part of contributing to, uh, to, to certain cultural aesthetics, nationalism. Um, and I think that that, yeah, it's hard to say like, you know, it, I mean, is the figure in that totally, well, it is static, 
it, it definitely changes in relation to how we're moving around it, what happens around it. The context is continually shifting, you know? And so I think in that it's going, well, how do you like, could you ever create something that would be uh, con like continuous in that thing other than, I guess, in uh, now, yeah, other than like maybe I'm thinking about monuments that kind of symbolise a, a grief or a mourning, you know? And that was a part of the research and whether these things could hold that. Mm. These monuments, these static monuments can also hold the grief and the mourning as much as the elation of discovery. Mm. Mm. So what, I mean, in terms of, of um, you know, and this has been happening o over the course of this year, <laughs> um, or last year rather, Yes. Um, you know, kind of globally where the, um, you know, historical figures, contentious historical figures were, were literally, or the representation of them were literally toppled and, and, and um, hmm. destroyed or thrown into rivers or, or wherever. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, what, what would you like to see happen with figures that, um, you know, let's talk about an Australian context, but the kind of, um, the kind of, um, memorialization of these figures as they sort of sit within a kind of a civic structure? Mm. Hmm. I think that um, due to my interest, and I'm going to give an, uh, an answer that is very particular to me, that I would like to see monuments that uh, talk to the transmission of things that, aren't, that, are, that can be seen in civic space, that talk to a continuation of handing over the monumental to somebody orally, physically, you know, that would be a civic monument that would really interest me and how that happens in continuum mm. and how that can con like continue to be passed in a certain way. I think that would interest me um, a lot to mm. see that, to see, you know, if things change, how things change, would they, like, to see that something lives and breathes through communicating with each other. And that's the kind of monument that interests me, that continual communication between, between people, between bodies, that it's learnt and taught and um, yeah, able to be felt and embodied in different ways. The, they are the things that interest me in civic space. And I mean, we do have, we do have um, there is actually, in some ways it does exist, the last post, for example, is performed every Sunday at 4 p.m. at the um, Australian War Memorial. Because um, I was looking for, for notions of this, you know, that it, it that where it happens, and mm. and you can go and you can watch it. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for to be, you know, particular about that. And they're the, they are the kinds of things that I would like to see in civic space. How do we continue to hold on to transmission and see it bodily be in another person and with others? Yep. And how could that accumulate over time? And again, I think there is also um, uh, notions of this in different uh, First Nations architecture with, you know, I love the example of the midden, you know, the pile of refuse where it's, it becomes this carnal thing to shuck an oyster, to eat, a, to eat a mollusk, and to throw it there to say, we ate together, we were together, and our living remains here accumulate. That, to me, is interesting, and they are the kinds of monuments I'd love to see, um, or activations I'd like to see in public space. Something that honors something greater than, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it would have to talk to a specific time, a particular, but, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, something honors that honors something greater than um, uh, enlightenment as we know it. Mm. Mm. I mean, is is this just better? Uh, uh, you know, are some, and this is a question about, um, you know, because I don't, I literally don't think that um, the pulling down of statues of, um, you know, predominantly white men is mm. going to um, remedy remedy no um, absolutely anything, not or, or, or certainly kind of change the contentiousness around um, the um, you know the actions and, and how history but I'm sure it I'm sure um, I'm very sure that it physically feels probably I mean and probably feels quite good for the people who are doing it at the time mm. <laughs> mm. 
Um, and so maybe there is a slight remedy in the in the um, in the notion of revenge, but I don't believe that it does. You know, it's not. It's a placeholder for yeah. a deeper thing. Yeah. And you know, the, I remember talking to a curator who was talking about decommissioning racist artworks, and I was like, Yeah, okay, you could do that, but then this this. The reason these things aren't, aren't are made or produced, they're not put there to like make people feel good. We're not that that's it's not that's not always the role of of art. It's to document mm. a thing mm. sometimes. It's more than the feelings of good. And it is more than the good intention. And it is not necessarily to go, well, we're gonna take away the things that are bad. It's that we keep them to continually readdress things as they arise. Mm. You can't erase that. Mm. You don't take it away. You can't, you can't stamp it away. And, you know, honestly, I don't, that's, I, that, that I, feels incredibly patronizing to think that I can't look history in the eyes and not know exactly what happened and not be able to go into a critical conversation with that, mm. you know, and to continue to document things as they happen, yeah. I, 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 yeah, so yes, I understand that the tearing down of monuments um, doesn't, doesn't you know, stand in a place of radical change. It did feel quite interesting to do it myself and it was a very good lesson. Mm. <laughs> but I also was aware that the, the, that, that again is a fantasy image. It's a, and, it, and, it's, and it's a thing that is happening and I understand why that happens and that then becomes the monument to refer to. Mm. That, that action, that change is something that we then refer to. Mm. I mean, maybe it's you know, about um, a question of having um, a different kinds of monuments, you know, maybe that they're not the figure and, and they're not as, um, as kind of, um, you know, kind of immortalizing of a person for whatever they represent, but, you know, maybe they can be much more, um, you know, and take a different, you know, I'm saying this from a, an aesthetic perspective, but, you know, yeah. take a completely different form that's far more interesting. Yeah. And open to, um, you know, a, a vexatiousness and open to a kind of um, contentiousness of interpretation. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think sometimes things become monuments after time without the intention of setting out to be, you know, and I think that there is, it, it's also, and an I'm, I'm not, I'm aware of the fact that it's the language of it, you know, you claim something to be monumental and people are like, aha, it's, it's got a platitude, it's got a, it has to be, it has a way of being viewed, it has like a, it's imbued with a certain amount of importance and of course at that point there is going to be a moment of contention, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think that there, and I, I'm not, um, I'm definitely not unhopeful, mm. you know. I think that absolutely there will be monuments that are made that are like, incredibly exciting, incredibly carnal, incredibly bodily, mm. and they are the ones that I'm um, interested in. Mm. And, and yeah, not, not static. But in saying that, do I, do I disagree with the static uh, objects that, you know, or monuments that exist? Absolutely not. No, no, no. I, I think that they're a really um, interesting thing to work. They're, they're there mm. and then they will continue to be worked through in different ways. And yeah, it is important to like continue to hold history in regard, you know, um, in order to, yeah, to kind of move, move with things in the present. Yeah. Um, putting it out of, of this work or, mm. you know, looking back and, and reflecting on, um, on last year, Obviously, a very difficult, um, you know, time for many people, um, you know, mentally and emotionally and environmentally. Um, but you know, certainly it, it was, um, you know, difficult for. All, and Amrita is also, I should mention, um, is it participates in the um, studio program here, the sixteen studios uh, that form a uh, central core of, of Gertrude's role. But so all of the, all of the artists. Um, 
were in, in line with um, the um, um, you know restrictions placed on everyone in Melbourne were um, were not allowed to use their studios during this time, which was you know I think um, was really challenging for for all of the artists. Really, but it, I think it offered a real opportunity to kind of um, you know in some ways kind of pause and reflect on their practice and and sort of reflect on you know a, a, a kind of a, a very strangely evolving. Um, world for all, all kinds of political and, and social and cultural reasons. Mm. But I guess, you know, pulling, again pulling out from um, the visual arts, you know, this was who have, are now in a very fortunate position and we're so happy to be reopened to the public. And I think this is, um, you know, taking on that point of the encounter, I think is so important within the, the visual arts um, sector as well, where it's not just about the kind of the representation of of images and, and experiencing work like that, but it is about that bodily and spatial and contextual engagement with the work or being in the presence with the work. But you know, dance is still not quite in that, um, you know, being part of that, um, you know, if we think about the venues as being kind of more um, theatres or, or specific kind of, um, uh, you know, performing art centres are still not quite in a position to be able to, mm. um, you know, kind of resume the same uh, way that they were operating a, a year mm. or so ago. So, for you as a dancer mm. and as a choreographer, you know, I think, um, did you want to reflect on how that uh, idea of, um, of um, you know, kind of the elimination of contact in <laughs> some ways or the elimination of being able to connect with people um, you know, other dancers, mm. you know, because of all the restrictions, you know, behavioural restrictions that were placed on us. I mean, not as part of your, um, you know, thinking of it more as from the perspective of, of, of dance and, what, and how you think that that has impacted on, on that particular sector and, and, and things that it might have learned. Mm. Well, I'm here to listen and to serve. I mean, the especially the good ones, and, and that is like, on a, yeah, their presence is undeniable, and so I understand that it was hard, and, it, and I do miss, of course I miss being in the theatre, and I hope that maybe the absence of that creates, you know, the kind of impassioned uh, reverie to return, and I think it will, um, because, I mean, personally, as much as I have loved watching a few things, and I revisit them, um, and have been, you know, lucky to see them from a different perspective. There's nothing for me personally like that live being together and witnessing something with a, with others. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there is. I remember this moment of like watching the uh, Paris Opera Ballet, and she kind of this one moment where I it was quite quite young, and I just remember one of the dancers fell terribly and I thought that is so entertaining that like the one moment that you just might get erased from you know the another encounter mm. if it were you know where is the hiccup that can happen and mm. the liveness and the improvisation and that only happens in these encounters and, and dance has been doing that for a very long time you know to improvise with a with a degree of care so yeah I'm at this moment, I mean, we, it's still so new. We don't know mm. exactly what the effects are, but I'm hoping that the absence creates a very, um, yes, impassioned return. But I know that for those that I have been fortunate enough to dance with, we continue and we supported each other and we danced where we could when we could, mm. just like most artists. Mm. I mean, I guess I'm just reflecting on something you said just before we sat down about yeah. that you were in rehearsals at the moment and um, you know I think even thinking about um, dancers you know as as you would think about um, you know athletes um, and thinking about the you know difficulties with the Australian Open and you know difficulty mm. for Olympians and trying to keep that same motivation keep that same um, you know fitness trajectory but mm. you know I guess that's also something that dancers will really feel not just about their kind of um, physical capabilities, but there, um, yeah, I guess there would be a sort of degree of, of, of rustiness that mm. would um, be impacting everybody. But like all of us, 
Like all of us, there's that social rustiness. I mean, I can understand with athletes who are like, I'm doing this to win. And I admire that mm. ambition. But I don't know if dancers are like, I'm in it to win. <laughs> Some might be. Because there isn't, there's no star status in contemporary dance. Like, there is no, I mean, I think there is, because I hold the people that I admire in that echelon. But um, when you're not doing it to win, what are you doing it for? And there is, yeah, there is that rustiness that we're all adjusting to. But there's, there's also the internal, like, yeah, the, the other workings. And again, I would say that that lack of doing maybe brings back this way of doing them that incorporates the rustiness mm. into it. And yeah, dance is, dance is so um, enigmatic like that. It mm. absorbs things like that and then goes, okay, well, this is where we are and this is what I'm working with and this is how I continue to work with what I have until it regains a certain, um, yeah, until you work with what you have to get the thing that you want, you know? And I mean, we look, look, I'm not, it's obviously a different experience. I mean, if you were talking to the Australian Ballet, I'm sure that they would have a very different experience. But we're talking about, we're talking about not just bodies here, we're talking about thinkers, we're talking about people that are like critically engaged and that is the dance community. They are like, they're not just acting these things, they're really like embodying them all the time. And in the port, like I remember somebody saying to me, Oh, you don't dance every day, and I was like, "No, I'm not in. I'm I'm doing the dancing by doing the thinking. I'm doing it by doing the other things that I'm doing, by doing the actions that I'm doing. It doesn't. Yeah, it. it I mean, I hate to say it, but it become it. It is a big part of my identity mm. of doing of keeping the fire burning because there is always, yeah, something to experiment with, mm. and it's not just like I can only do it when I'm fit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we might, t if anybody has some questions from the audience, anyone for some ideas? Hmm. Or, um, well, um, Rita will be um, around until we'll, we'll re resume the, the, the volume on her work, but um, I'd like to um, sincerely thank Rita for all of her um, generosity and um, if, I'm sure if anybody had have any particular questions that they should be, it is obviously very, very uh, approachable. Um, and I, I was just reflect on that idea of um, that there are no star dancers. I think, um, you know, this audience is here um, to witness something <laughs> akin to that. But um, I'd like to um, ask you all to um, sincerely thank Amrita. And thank you much.